so um, the way we're going to uh, run the session is as a panel discussion. So we've got a, uh, a, a series of questions that I've got that we will go around the panelists. Uh, they've seen the questions in, in advance. Um, and so we'll hopefully get a good discussion going here. We are also aiming to have some time at the end to have questions uh, uh, from those who are attending or if it, like in the physical sense, questions from the floor. There's um, two ways of doing that. Uh, either use the chat function and myself and Tevin are going to try and keep an eye on the chat function. So if there is a question that comes through there, we will then actually bring it up and ask it for the uh, panelists. Or you should also see as well, for those of you who click on participants, uh, and then you, you should see a raise hand function there, a little blue hand. So uh, if that's the case, if you raise your hand there, we can uh, actually call you in and ask you, and you can ask the question directly to the panel. So the discussion today is uh, pedagogy and surviving the pandemic, uh, challenges, pitfalls, and successes. I'm delighted to have on the panel uh, Professor Joan Ballantyne. Joan is a professor of accounting at the University of Ulster. Uh, she is current, she's held many roles within BAFA. She is currently the chairperson of CDAF, the Committee of Department Heads in Accounting and Finance. She's also a, an editorial board member of the uh, Accounting Education Journal. Second on the panel, we have uh, Linda Hickson. Linda Hickson is an associate professor and head of accounting and finance uh, department at De Montfort University. Uh, I also noticed as well, heavily involved with a uh, junior rugby club team in, near Peterborough. Nice. And uh, Linda is a secretary of the accounting education SIG and is also a member of the editorial board of accounting and education journal. And finally, we have Professor Greg Stoner. Uh, Greg is a professor of accounting at the University of Glasgow, where he's head of the accounting and finance subject group. Uh, Greg is currently one of the editors of Accounting Education Journal and is chairperson of the Accounting Education SIG. So thank you all very much, all three of you, for uh, agreeing to be part of the panel. Um, if I start off, and uh, first question, uh, we'll start off with you, Greg, if you don't mind. Um, so looking back over the pandemic to date, uh, what do you think have been the key challenges identified by accounting and finance academics? Um, right, well, I think part, part, part of my response here is based on the uh, paper that Alan um, Alan Sankster, Barbara Flood and myself did for accounting education, where we got we got uh, uh, in, international responses from about from about 44 countries, if I remember rightly, I get slightly confused by the exact number. Um, so, so, so to sort of respond broadly internationally, as well as to some extent um, making comments on the on the sort of national environment. And um, I mean, clearly, it's not it's not um, news to people to know that the, the biggest challenge has been the the switch to blended or whatever we like to call it. Um, which in reality is not for most of us been a switch to blended, but been a switch to completely online provision. Um, and there was a there was a very immediate um, problem, you know, the emergency issue back in March when when we had to deal with things. And I suspect we all got away with doing things in a pretty rough and ready way on many occasions. Certainly, my conversion was not very thoughtful at the time. It was a matter of doing it the next day, in fact, in my case. Um, and, and we think we learned some things from those things, but um, probably not quite as much as perhaps we'd hoped. Um, and, and of course, then the big challenge was trying to decide what to do in the next semester. Um, clearly, in other parts of the world, they were um, in a different phase in the Southern Hemisphere, but so they were, they were trying to learn to to do more major things, uh, whole courses instead of the last week or so, was, um, which was a bit more difficult. But we, we learned something from them to some extent. And I think one of the things that, that the international thing shows that there's a, a, the, the challenges, the things like digital technical problems, um, what technologies did you have? Um, did people have the right sort of broadband networks? Did they have the right sort of equipment? This is particularly prevalent in countries which are less well off than us. But what we 
what I think is important to remember is that there are sectors of our own um, country which have, have very similar problems. Um, and per perhaps not in places you might expect. I think one of the challenges, perhaps I shouldn't be saying this, but I will, but one of the challenges we have found in Glasgow is actually one of the worst broadband places is our own halls of residence because they weren't really designed to have all those students online all day, every day. And so mm. we, you, have un, you have these technical problems in unexpected places. And I think this is um, quite difficult to think about sometimes. There's a big support and knowledge deficit, uh, support from central services, support, you know, generally speaking, and a lot of knowledge deficits in, member, in us as members of staff in trying to do this stuff, because most of, most of us and many of our colleagues have not really thought very, very much about online deliveries, delivery and how that sh needs to be different to the standing up in front of people and talking mode, which is the norm, I guess. Some structural problems in terms of um, the lack of flexibility within our, within our organisations, and I'll perhaps say a bit more about that later, um, which can be problematic. Um, I think one of the big issues, and again, I think this is going to be addressed by another question in a minute, but um, assessment has been a massive challenge. How do we how do we how do we maintain some rigour in in our assessment uh, given the changes we've had to make? I suspect, I suspect one of the most obvious challenges is stress. Work-life balance, um, well-being, whatever we like to, to think of this as. And we see this every day with our colleagues. Um, some of our colleagues are um, really stressed, really bur burning out, I think, um, really problematic situations. Um, but I think there's also a problem in some respects in terms of student stress. Um, which perhaps doesn't get recognised as much. And I think one of the big reasons for this is actually something which is obvious, but less thought about, which is the, lack, the loss of community, the loss of, you know, the challenge which arises from not having people you can bump into in the corridor. And they, this is the problem for us, but it's even a bigger problem for students who don't even know the people they're expected to be working with. So I think this is something which is very difficult to address in the sort of large classes, which are typical, certainly in my institution, I guess in, in most accounting departments in the UK. Um, I think just to be kind of um, optimistic a bit, we, I think in the, in the review, the, the paper, data collection that we did, um, the, the, we'll see people see a lot of opportunities too opportunities for change, opportunities for doing things better than we've done before, a move towards student-centred types of approaches. Um, despite the, the, the concern about the rush, etc. But people saw, saw opportunities there. I'll be honest, I'm beginning to wonder whether we're taking, we're taking those opportunities up as much as we should. And I see that as a, a challenge as we move forward because I see elements of what we're doing now to be a long-term solution rather than just a short-term solution. And I think this leads to the one of the biggest challenges for us in terms of the long-term, which we hint at towards the end of that paper. And there are elements of this coming out through some of the, the contributions, which is the long-term future situation for accounting education. Um, and the, the threat that any the threat that the success or the lack of disaster, perhaps, of the online switch um, has to the future of perhaps some of our campus provision and changing the way in which we as academics might be working long term, um, the commod commod commodification perhaps of some of the accounting um, acad academic labour as well, um, provision of this stuff in a more remote, pre-packaged kind of format. And I think this is something which we need to be really aware of looking forward into the longer term, uh, because I think it might make a, a massive um, change if we're not careful about this. Um, and I think this is particularly the case when, um, perhaps we don't like to think of it as this way, but I think we, we often know that business schools and accounting in particular um, are often seen as sort of cash cow um, income generating activities within universities. 
and if they if the universities catch on to the idea that is and build on the idea that is prevalent, I think still in some universities that accounting isn't a real discipline. We can do it cheaply online, um, and we might just get swamped by that position. I think we have to be really concerned about that long term threat, if you like. Um, and the other um, threats is or or whatever is challenge is how do we maintain the importance of research in this environment this will be particularly problematic if we do move down the avenue which i mentioned a minute or so ago but i think it's particularly important in the short term uh, as well as well in many respects i'm not sure if that covers everything that's that people oh. think but i think that's that's the kind of elements i would concentrate on i think yeah that's great thanks very much greg uh, a good overview uh, to kick us off uh, Joan or Linda, do you want to come in, maybe pick up on a point or add something else? Could I maybe just encourage people? Um, I'm just, I've just put the, the title of the paper and uh, the date. Uh, I think really the, the paper itself is an excellent compilation of experiences, as Greg has said, from right across the world. And I think really reading quite a lot of the experiences really mirrors quite a, in terms of what you're currently experiencing. So, and, and there's an excellent introduction at the start where there's lots of tables about the sorts of issues that are in, you know, that have come out of the uh, complete analysis. So really just encourage anyone who wants to get a broad perspective of issues to go and read the paper. Great, thanks, Joan. I've just put up the URL if you can't be bothered to type in at all. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, Linda, do you want to, um, have you got a slightly different perspective maybe coming from, uh, uh, from De Montfort, any additional concerns that are coming up? I think um, Greg covered um, most of it and, mm -hmm. and maybe there's just one other concern that, that feeds into a lot of that, which is trying to balance um, the needs of the university, the needs of the student, the needs of the staff. Um, so uh, it, it's trying to balance all, all three of those perspectives. Um, and, and, and that feeds very much into all of the issues that Greg mentioned, um, particularly with the long term impact as well. Great. I think we'll, we'll, we'll come back to some of those points, I think, in some of the discussion uh, uh, later on. Um, I, I think it's very apt, and it was one of the main points that, uh, that you raised at the beginning, uh, Greg, um, and it's that time of year in terms of the semester where we're being uh, asked to think about uh, not just assessments, but also about exams, so, uh, and writing exams and how exams are going to be delivered. I know at my own institution, there's still a question mark over how we're going to actually deliver the uh, end of semester exams in January. So, but this, uh, uh, Joan, do you want to um, come in on that about um, what can we learn from what we did at the end of last academic year and what are the challenges for assessments now, particularly, I suppose, in relation to examinations? Okay, thank you, Stuart. I think, yeah, Stuart, there is, there's two separate things here. There's what has already happened and what were the challenges and what, what's going to happen going forward. I think we can learn quite a lot from what happened already and build that into the future. So we're not, in a, you know, we're not firefighting as it were, because I think you're right, Greg, we were firefighting in the last semester and we have passed that stage and the professional bodies give us grace. And that grace is it's not running out, but I think they expect us to be a bit more organized. So just with respect, to what we already know, um, Stuart, from before. Uh, CDAF had collected responses from CDAF members and Linda and myself had carried out a, a series of informal interviews uh, with a few heads of department. And what we did, we came, came up with a kind of a, a framework with how individual departments, accounting and finance departments were dealing with uh, their assessments. And you'll find this, if you wanna to go to the paper, it's a really good read. Well, I think it is on page, 
544 to 547. And what we essentially um, found, we essentially found that there was absolutely huge variation in how accounting and finance departments right across the UK were dealing with their assessment. So we had from the... Um, what we call the retention, in other words, or departments that retained what they were generally doing, my own institution being one, and actually I think the majority of the Irish institutions seem to go along this path. So we stuck as close as possible to what we already had planned. We didn't change any exam dates. We didn't extend anything. Uh, we kept our exams normally till the normal three hours. Plus we would have given say maybe up to one hour for the students to download and upload their examinations. So there wasn't a huge uh, amount of change. Now compare that there to, uh, and as I say, you can read more about it in the wee summary that we produced to organizations where there was a complete, seemed to be a complete transformation in how they were delivering their assessments. So there was a flurry of activity in terms of completely trying to change the examinations that put staff under the most enormous amount of pressure. Um, there was also, in terms of the time frame, some universities were allowing students, believe it or not, up to two weeks to do their examination. So we get this huge variation between three hours plus one to up to th two weeks. Now that in itself, Stuart, so, the, so there was changes in two ways there, changes in terms of the time frame uh, permitted to do the examination. And there was also changes with respect to the nature of the assessment. So some universities not changing really anything at all to other universities fundamentally trying to change, but doing it under very difficult circumstances. And perhaps there being a lack of consistency in terms of what they thought was appropriate in terms of this radical change. There's a whole lot of, I've jotted down, Stuart, a whole lot of challenges, I think, that occurred our, during our discussions and from our feedback that occurred as a result of that. The first thing that is that some organizations were operating in a, a kind of a vacuum where they didn't know if their alternative assessments were actually going to be permitted uh, for accreditation purposes. So Linda maybe could say more about that later, but there were situations where, you know, assessments were having to be changed and there was a time lag between the professional bodies coming back and saying, yes, that's okay. So to some extent, a lot of uncertainty and we can address that in the, in the next part, Stuart, when we can give a little bit more guidance about what the professional bodies are looking for. I think also, um, there was the extreme time or the extreme pressure that staff were feeling in terms of moving just to the online bit. So getting prepared for the online bit and then they had this additional examination and assessment thing to contend with and it really was too much. Greg, you've mentioned a little bit there about the rigor in the assessment. Um, I think there was, from what we saw, there was very little in the way of moderation going on. Uh, either internal moderation, there wasn't enough time to do external moderation, but certainly I think we do need to think about rigor and that's one of the things we'll talk about in the next bit. There was a huge issue about plagiarism and the, the possibility for collusion. Now this was particularly the case and seemed to be reported more where institutions were facilitating uh, more than say the three plus one hours. So where they were given more than even one day, there seemed to be a, a lot of discussion around the possibility for plagiarism inclusion. The thing about plagiarism is that if students write an examination, you can't check for it. You might get them to upload it to turn it in, but you're just wasting your time. Uh, there's a huge possibility for students for collusion. I've heard through the grapevine, this has been going on and we don't have any way of catching it. And that's something I think we have to be mindful as we go forward. I think also some universities um, seem to be up against this, the no detriment policy that the university, you know, from the center of the university, we're saying we need to ensure that, you know, no student is penalized at all. But of course, we are different. We are, uh, uh, for, we have to get the professional accreditation. We have to make sure the standards are upheld, et cetera, et cetera. So there was a this huge pushback in terms of the needs of the professional accreditation and then fighting almost against the university. So I would say um, those are the main uh, challenges, Stuart, and as you can see, 
there is huge or there was huge variation in what universities were doing in terms of assessment and examinations and we'll come back to uh, I think we need to now reduce that variation I think that would be fair to say in terms of moving forward and you know ensuring that we have robust assessment and examination place in place uh, for the professional bodies as we go forward. That's great. Thanks very much, Joan. Um, we'll talk a little bit in, in a minute about the relationship between our own assessment designs and exemptions for professional bodies and what's driving what and, uh, in, in that uh, realm at the moment. But maybe, uh, Greg or Linda, if you wanted to come in on this, and one of the things I wanted to chuck in here as well was um, the way that decisions are being made uh, at higher up at university levels and then being brought down and we have to try and interpret them um, uh, in various different ways. And one of the things I'm thinking of here from my own experience is that it's, uh, we've ended up actually in a scenario where we've had to change assessment strategies to reduce the amount of examination time because there is problems uh, with the exams in terms of the overall uh, weighting. So that reduces say from having 50% or 70% down to 50% in, uh, in a module. And the gap is then filled by another assessment. And so we end up over, moving towards more assessment points. So we end up with three assessment points on a module instead of previously two. And I was wondering if that is that an experience that's happening elsewhere uh, and what the potential problems with that is, or if you wanted to talk about assessment more generally. Um, Linda? Um Certainly, I, I hadn't heard of um, anyone else, I'll be honest with you, of moving to three assessment points. So the people that we spoke to um, for our article, um, none of them mentioned that that was uh, an issue for them. Um, so that's interesting. It's what we're, worth having a look at in that one. Uh, I, I certainly agree with your comment about trying to um, meet the needs the requests, shall I put it like that, coming from coming from higher up, and uh, it did seem to be a little bit of a battle for the the pre summer exams, um, particularly because we have some um, some modules that are exempting and some that aren't. So this, this is what I've done: is actually we were able to use the professional bodies as a as a, as a justification for, for sticking to our guns in some cases and saying, well, we've got to do it like this. The professional bodies insist, um, which, which was, was quite good as a fallback. It was difficult for anyone to argue against. Um, however, the non-exempting modules, we were expected to run those in the same way as all of the modules in the business school. And so therefore you've got this lack of consistency. You've got some that are, uh, are being run in a certain way and no detriment couldn't be applied. And others where they're saying, well, no detriment does apply. And, and, and I think that was altogether really confusing for students. Uh, I think they, they were never quite sure whether or not they needed to submit an assessment, whether they could still pass the module without submitting that further assessment. So I, I do think there's a, a definite need to look at those communications and to see how we can manage it better. Um, as Greg mentioned, it was firefighting purely in May, and I, I think we all need to look at how we can manage that better for, the, um, for this academic year. Yeah, I think, think I'd add to that an element of um, of um, creep, if you like. Um, the university made us, made, I mean, they didn't give us choices, to be perfectly honest. Um, certainly my institution didn't. We had, we had, we were told some things we were allowed to do. We argued the case for some of our courses on accreditation grounds to be, to be different. And we got, we got our way in some respects, but not in others. Um, but the universities, I think, certainly in my case, see massive benefits from their own perspective, like not having to hire half of Glasgow's halls in order to run exams. Um, but I suspect there's going to be a, a large amount of creep into the future of um, reducing the number of um, in, in, you know, traditional examinations, basically. Um, and clearly we would want some of those to main, maintain some of those. The other thing to kind of comment on Stuart's point about extra assessments, 
um, my university has gone a long way, and I think quite a few are across different disciplines talking about low stakes assessment. Um, um, it's a phrase that's being banded around a lot um, in many places, which is often taken to mean, probably wrongly, um, splitting your assessment into smaller parts so each one is less risky um, for the students, that is, um, in terms of you know, technical downtime and things like that. But it's also really meant to be more about making sure that our students are reasonably well prepared for the types of assessments they're doing. And that's probably something they're probably not looking at in quite so much detail across the academy. And I don't think that's just accounting. I think that's across the whole, the whole university. Um, I think the, you know, the, I think for, 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 our, for me, and I think it's probably true in quite a lot of places, the frustration is the, the, the imposition of, of things from above, which um, are not quite what we would want to do and not quite, not always necessarily justified uh, or at least not justified to us, but anyway, I think that's probably enough for now. <laughs> right, uh, can we then talk a little bit about looking forward into the future um, and the kinds of things that are being said by the professional bodies in relation to exemptions and assessment strategies now. So we've all recognised that it, it, that it was firefighting, that we kind of, you know, it was whatever, we did our best and that was what was considered acceptable uh, um, earlier in the summer. What's coming from the professional bodies at the moment on, on assessment and exemptions? Are they much tighter now and expecting things, us to operate in a, a different manner? Joan, do you want to start with this uh, one? Yeah, I'll, may, I'll maybe start, Stuart. Um, well, Stuart, at a CDAF, uh, you know, we, 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 as you all know, we are the heads of Department of Accounting and Finance. We encourage anybody that wants to join, please join us because we do have some fantastic events. We had one on the 2nd of October, and you'll see in the chat line uh, that um, Paul Jennings has put up the link to a video uh, and this video was where we uh, we invited the professional bodies to come along and talk about assessment and accreditation. So you'll find that video, you can see it there. Um, I think you have to download it first of all before it works correctly. Uh, so if you want to, as we, we called it straight from the horse's mouth, so we wanted to get the professional bodies to come along and give us their views about what was going on. Now, there was a lot of preamble at that meeting, um, Stuart, no doubt. They were trying to sell their wares, et cetera, but they did eventually come down and tell us not completely what they wanted, but here's a, here's a broad summary of the issues that they want us to consider. So the first thing is when you're writing uh, an examination or, an, or assessment, you have already mentioned, Stuart, that the 50%, the FRC, um, most of you know that all of these professional bodies with the exception of SEMA are regulated by the FRC and the FRC are pushing a requirement that at least half of the total assessments as 50% has to be by some form of formal examination, whatever that might be. So that's a requirement that's coming from the FRC and that has been pushed on to the, by the professional bodies. Now, in terms of the sorts of uh, examination, the professional bodies were looking for, well, they're, they're talking about certainly at the higher levels, that we need to consider the sort of question style that we uh, write. So moving away from your kind of just your basic knowledge based questions to more kind of robust sort of questions based on, for example, maybe scenarios or case based or opinion, you know, you can still ask some of the knowledge stuff, but then you can ask students to give their opinions, you can ask them to use the data more. Uh, these are, you know, moving away almost from, you know, the closed book to an open book, because there's no point in pretending that these examinations are closed book anymore, they're open book. So that was the first thing in terms of the questions and the, the assessment for the exams. Now, Stuart, just to say or retort back to what you said about the number of assessments, there was no mention of the number of assessments. They're not requiring us to have three, four, five assessments. They're absolutely not doing that. So my take off it was, and maybe Linda and Greg or anybody else, Paul, maybe could say something from the audience, was that they would be quite happy to see me. 
two forms of assessment, the enforcement itself. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that they were strongly urging us to consider the time frame. And this goes back to what uh, I had said earlier on. We had this enormous uh, gap between the three plus one hour and the up to two weeks, which Anyway, that happened. It's we're in a different time frame now. So what they were saying, the professional bodies generally are saying that they're recommending no more than about 24 hours. So no more than about 24 hours. Try and keep it uh, as low as you can in terms of the time frame. Um, you know, but certainly no more than about the 24 hours. So that's the second thing. So the first thing is around the assessment and the examination, the sort of questions. Second thing is about the time frame. I'll just go on to the third one, which is about, these aren't in any particular order. The third one is about invigilate, vigilation. So there has been a lot of discussion around the possibility of proctoring software. And there was quite a bit of discussion at the event about that there. The professional bodies are not insisting on proctoring for the academic year 2020-21. So it's not a current issue, but that doesn't mean to say they didn't say anything about the future. So if this thing goes on, maybe it will be an issue because as you know, the professional bodies have proctoring software. But for the moment, the professional bodies are saying that the proctoring issue is not an issue that they are concerned with. They're not going to require it. This is an institutional issue. So that's the third thing. The next thing is about plagiarism. So the plagiarism issue, they're saying they, they did recognize that there was a potential for plagiarism, particularly if you extend the time period. And the, uh, this was back to the, the, you know, that we need to be, we need to be really honest with ourselves and say, we need to recognize that these book, uh, these examinations are open book exams even though we call them closed book exams. And what they're saying, they're recommending that where possible, that we continue to use some sort of plagiarism software like Turnitin or whatever, where appropriate. Now, of course, as I've said earlier, there's no point in using Turnitin if you're getting students to submit some, some, something in written form. But if you're getting them to, for example, write their examinations, which I think, Linda, from conversations with you, you're wanting to do, to write their exams or maybe to put it into an Excel spreadsheet or whatever, then there is the potential uh, for the Turnitin software uh, or the anti-plagiarism software to work. So when you're making your request, what I would suggest to you, when you're making your request for accreditation, you need to mention these things that I'm talking about. So the time period, the question style, the plagiarism, the invigilation. And the last, the last thing we have is about moderation. So there's still the professional bodies, of course, are still very keen that we provide some evidence that we are going through some rigorous procedures within our own universities and externally. So it's recommended that we have moderation in place, and that would include your internal moderation and your external moderation. Now, one thing they did say about moderation, and, and which I feel very strongly about, how would we deal with significant grade inflation if it happened? So what would we do? They seem to be wanting us to say something about that. What would we do if, for example, 80% of the class got over 70% or whatever it is? Uh, so I think we probably need to be thinking about that. So the, the things again are the time period, the question style, the plagiarism, invigilation and moderation. So those are kind of the, the five key things that they have talked about. And, and I, I deliberately look, didn't um, pick up on any one professional body here because they're at different stages, it would seem. I mean, SEMA aren't, because they're not regulated by FRC, they don't seem to be, they're not as strict as the other ones. Um, and, you know, I deliberately, I don't want to pick up an ACAW versus ACCA versus ACAS because I'm not too sure that's terribly helpful, to be honest. What I do know is that my understanding of accreditation is that we are going to have to negotiate on an individual basis. My understanding is that these professional bodies are not going to come out with a kind of a blanket statement as, as in terms of what I've just said. Um, but if you, I think if you address those comments or those issues, I think you're in with a good chance, you know, of, of receiving your accreditation provided you are doing kind of roughly or working within their broad ballparks. Yeah, great. Okay, thanks, John. Uh, Linda, Greg, 
Um, do you want to come in uh, on this? Particularly, I suppose, the questions about grade inflation. That seemed to be something. Yeah, I'll come in on, on that, if I may, and also add one other element, um, which Joan alluded to, but I think need, needed um, to be made very clear, is that we're still expected to send in our assessments to some of the professional bodies. Mm -hmm. So even if you send an email explaining how you're going to meet all of these five criteria or recommendations, there's still a requirement to actually write the assessments and get them sent in and get that approval. So one thing I would recommend is that departments start thinking of this very early um, in order to get that approval through quickly. Not all of the professional bodies want that, um, but at least one of the um, main UK ones. And also CPA Australia wanted that from us as well. So if anyone's running exemptions um, through CPA Australia. Um, yeah, the grade inflation, we actually, we were one of the universities that allowed a longer time frame for students in May, but we did change our exam style. So we made it uh, much less objective uh, and much more based around case studies and scenarios, for example, um, and opinion based. So we felt it, it was actually much more difficult for students to um, just get 100% because they knew the techniques, for example. Uh, we also found that actually that made it, it a lot easier to pick up on plagiarism if people were expressing the same opinions or the same suggested um, strategies as a result of the case that we were presenting them. So in actual fact, when we did an analysis of the marks afterwards, on the majority of our modules, we didn't find that we had significant grade inflation. Um, but that didn't mean to say that we didn't have to have a process in place for how we would deal with that. So uh, we were looking at that. One of the things that we did, and I'm not sure whether other universities might consider that, is we actually put word count limitations onto exam questions. Uh, and that was to, to prevent um, students from just writing everything they knew about a topic area and getting 100% by default because they mentioned everything that could possibly be mentioned. <laughs> uh, so so we, we made sure we put a word, word count limit in. And then really you're rewarding the students who were able to analyse it and, and consider what was relevant to that particular case and that particular question. And, and so, as I said, we, we found we didn't really have the grade inflation because the better students were the ones who understood what was required from it. Great. Thanks, Linda. Um, I, actually, I'll just pick up on one point there and throw to, then throw to Greg, because it's, it, it's interesting with the open book style of questions that's coming out now and we're asking more than for uh, the kinds of things that we've been looking for for years about the critical discussion, your own opinions and so on. How, how does that leave then the more traditional style, particularly for first and second year students, when we would ask them to do, you know, computational questions where they could potentially get 100%. How is that going to play out, uh, do you think, in, in the next rounds of assessment? Um, I, I think we have to fix that sort of question and start asking the sorts of questions we ask them to analyse the figures or deal with more complicated things where there's more judgment involved, probably. Um, we, we did the same as uh, uh, De Montfort. We basically changed the nature of most... We had a, a slight issue because first, first and second year exams didn't run um, for, across the university, except for a few, few groups where accreditation was an issue. So we ran them in a later diet. We ran them in July, I think it was July. Um, and we did run them in timed manner, so we didn't have quite the, the same problems. But even those papers, we accepted the fact that they were basically open book exams. So took out the knowledge, any knowledge questions on the whole, um, on a, and on uh, technique type questions, we, as far as possible, allocated more marks um, to the discursive parts. I, I suspect that's probably what we need to do um, in order to prepare our students anyway. Um, I know there's always a big debate over accountants need to be actually do uh, need to be able to actually do the accounting, and um, that this is part of our accreditation requirements as well. But 
in the end of the day, that's not the main purpose, I don't think, of the university accounting. Well, that's my view anyway. Um, because if we all we do is train students to do the, the techniques, then they're not going to get decent jobs anyway. So I think I think we just I think this is one of the opportunities we have in pushing towards a, a more um, critical kind of approach, even in levels one and two. I have to say we've been using um, analysis of uh, I'm sure many places do, but we we've used analysis of academic papers in first year. Uh, financial accounting, for example, for I think about 10 or 15 years. So this isn't particularly new, but we did change the emphasis of our exams and took out the big compulsory questions on consolidation or whatever, mm. as far as we could, that sort of thing. All right, thanks, Greg. Joan, did you want to call in? Just wanted to say, yeah, I, I really, um, Stuart, want to echo what Greg has said. I think we should use this this COVID, you know, thing. There could be some good things come out of it, not much, but for education, uh, I think we can use this now as a really good way of looking back. I mean, let's face it. Um, are we happy with the sort of accountants that we churn out? I'm not sure we're happy with necessarily. I think we need to churn out accountants who are who have better skills at analysis, who question, who query, who challenge more. And I think we can use this here episode in our lives to start to think about creating these students with deeper learning skills, with the ability to challenge. And we can only do that, Stuart, by asking questions, asking questions and getting them to express their opinion. I, I, I would never think that any first year exam should only be numbers. I would say there should be a huge splattering there of um, why are you doing these numbers? What do the numbers actually mean? So why don't we look at this as a good opportunity to actually change something that, that we know is broken and it has been widely documented in the literature? Yeah, great. Thanks, Joan. Okay, let's move on. I might... Um... In terms of the questions that we looked at beforehand, I think I'll put four and five together, which are kind of uh, on the one side, it, they're to do with the workloads issues then, in, both in terms of what colleagues are, are suffering in terms of the challenges around remote working, we talked about technological deficits already, uh, uh, stress, etc., but also then about are there some benefits potentially that come out of this? And we potentially we talked about one of those already in terms of assessments. Um, are there some good pedagogical practices that are going to come in terms of uh, online teaching? Uh, Linda, do you want to um, start off with this? Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll start with the uh, challenges and then go on to the positives, and we are seeing the positives. Um, first thing I'd like to say is I'm a relatively new head of department, so um, I had very little experience pre-COVID uh, and um, no preconceived ideas, I guess, about what running a, an accounting department would be like. I guess you alluded to, to my rugby career earlier. I'd liken it to um, a rugby match quite early on in my career, where I was refereeing the British uh, special, um, special Forces against uh, an RAF side. And I had to keep my, on, my eye on everything, not just the ball, um, because there were things <laughs> going on all over the place. Um, some, uh, well, the majority of them quite, uh, quite challenging, I guess. So I, I'd liken it to that. Um, so looking at the challenges first, we, we've got to think of, staff first and foremost and there have been well-being issues um, amongst amongst some of ourselves at the um, accounting education sig we've talked about the um sorry that's my dog in the background <laughs> we've talked about the uh, the trials of being online for for lengthy periods of time and, and how you get that, that fatigue, uh, if you like, from delivering online and with students who um, keep their videos switched off or don't chat to you. And um, there's also the issues of not actually meeting, um, there's not actually meeting up with your colleagues. Um, there's also the issues of having a big dog in the background who wants to join in, I'm really sorry. And um, so there are those, those, definitely those well-being issues. And there are some staff who are, are very, very anxious about the current situation. And 
I'm just going to shut my dog. Greg, would you like to take over for one minute while I just... Exactly. <laughs> just point out, Greg, I just point out that uh, we have got the chat function there. Thank you very much for a uh, couple of people who've made comments in there already. Uh, particularly, I just point people in the direction. Pauline Wheatman uh, made a comment about the role in relation to assessments, the role that the Board of Accreditation of Educational Courses uh, uh, can play uh, in terms of actually uh, exerting a little bit of pressure on, on uh, institutions. Um, but uh, encourage people who are still on the call to actually, if you have got a question, if you want to put it in the actual uh, chat function there, that'd be great and we will uh, ask the panelists. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll let Linda carry on to me. <laughs> yeah, I did enough filling. Okay. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'm back. Um, so yeah, the, 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 the staff well-being, they're also the practical issues with staff. So whether the, the home workspace is a suitable workspace for them, um, whether they have dogs or, or small children, um, you know, children haven't been at school, so staff have been asked to manage both looking after their, their children and maintaining their workload at the same time. And very often as well, we find that actually our life is a little bit easier over the vacation, which it hasn't really been this year because staff have been required to get up to date with the technology, to become familiar with that, to record asynchronous lectures, maybe to rewrite the work. Um, so, so there have been a lot of challenges and a lot of demands on staff. And we wouldn't normally see, from a personal perspective, I don't think we'd normally see people feeling as jaded this early in the term as, as we are doing this year. So the, there's definitely that issue that we need to keep an eye on and, and both departments and the universities need to make sure that they're monitoring and providing everything they can for staff, staff well-being. Um, in, in terms of the, the positives, we're actually seeing some real positives. We've, um, this is adding to staff workload, of course, but, but we're redesigning not just for a, a temporary basis. We're looking at this, as, as Joan says, as an, as an opportunity to completely redesign the way we deliver our courses um, and to think about what, you know, start from scratch. What are the what are the learning outcomes from this? And what's the best way of delivering those learning outcomes? Whereas I think maybe there's offered a tendency year on year to, um, to just build on what you've already done. And, and this year we've completely changed that and, and everything is being uh, created and developed from scratch. And I think we're, we're, providing, um, we're providing material that, that actually is, is much more fit for purpose in today's today's educational environment, so I think that's a real a real benefit, a real positive um, from this. That's great. Thanks very much, Linda. Greg. Yeah, I mean, one of when the question was, what are the challenges of running an account in the finance department in these times? You could probably take out in these times in terms of the the first of my comments, but it has been exacerbated, and I've just written here the nonsense from above. Um, um, and that's a kind of a shorthand way of saying, you know, it's, it seems to me that universities do not have any, did not have any really very good um, contingency plan for anything, even vaguely approaching this. Um, the, the decisions which are being made seem to be being made at a very high level on, on, on the fly and sometimes not really taking into consideration things which seem obvious to those of us working nearer the coalface. Um, and in particular, didn't really see the way that some of the things that they were, were asking us to do, asking being a, a kind of a polite word, um, um, had significant results, time, um, particularly time um, demands on people in people who are often quite quite stretched already, to be perfectly honest, in, in some respects. And I think that's kind of one of the biggest problems that, that we have faced. And it's um, principally in my case from the university level, but the way that's been filtered through the school as well, or the college doesn't really necessarily help massively either. Um, 
there's some other issue, and I'm dwelling on some negatives here, which are which are not universal, but do, but but are reflective of the fact that change is difficult. Um, I think all of us have some inertia built into us. Um, uh, somebody of my size and weight definitely has inertia. Um, but um, it's you know we. We, we do things the way that we've done them before and we like doing them that way, we're comfortable doing that way. And, you know, to be asked to do something completely differently to what's been done before is challenging and it's bound to be challenging, challenging for everyone. I think one of the things that kind of surprised me, um, it's not just in my department, um, but also elsewhere, I think is to some extent the, the degree of lack of, um, Lack of um, recognition that the change is necessary, and the and the the kind of resistance to, to change, and the the resistance because many people see it as just oh it's just this one, it's just these couple of weeks back in March, and we'll be all right in September, um, or you know those sorts of things. Oh, it's only this semester. Well, whereas I think we're beginning to recognise now that the the blend is online or whatever approach is probably going to be around for at least the next academic year um, and I suspect that there's going to be elements of it going forward a lot mm. further so it's not the majority of staff are unwilling to change but there are some um, as a head of department you know it's always I mean when I took over this role not all that long before COVID I'll be honest um, somebody said to me you'll find that 90% um, of your problems are created by 10% of the staff um, and I think that's that is part of the issue that we have in that there's some resistance in those quarters. Some of that resistance is caused quite quite rightly by the unrealistic workloads that we're putting on people um, as universities, and the uncertainty and the stress that that causes. So, so those things are kind of understandable. Um, I think the opportunities are along the lines that Linda said, really, I think, but, but, to, but to gain from those opportunities, we've got, we've got to recognize, and this is probably the most difficult thing, that some of the things we did in the past are not necessarily the best ways of doing things. Um, and, you know, there's, it's doubly difficult in terms of, uh, you know, one of the, the big issues is that we, in our, in our school, we said um, no face to no um, online to camera lectures. They're not happening. We said no video lectures should be more than 15, 20 minutes, something like that. And ideally, they should be shorter. So it's more about directed reading and those sorts of things. But the students don't like it because the students are comfortable with what they were hit with before. And mm -hmm members of staff are beginning to say, well, the students want us to do lectures, so why don't we just do that? Which is short code for saying, why do I have to change? Not all of them, but this is, and it's actually not as bad in my part of the school as it is in others, but, um, but so there's these kind of elements coming around, although I think we're also finding across the university that students get fairly quickly bored of two hour lectures to camera. Um, so I think we're probably doing the right thing. But these opportunities are only going to happen if we, if we look at them positively, and I think that's important. But the big problem is workload. Um, the, the workload issues on staff and managing it is difficult. And as you, as we all, are all aware, um, some things, you know, the, the bit that gets, that gets bitten into when workload is too high is research. And for many people, research is what they get promotion on. So that becomes rather more tricky um, in order to sell. So we are we are telling people that our PDR promotion processes will change in the next year. Um, but I'm not 100% sure that that will happen because of institutional inertia too. Um, so those things are, are difficult, to, difficult, and I don't really want to dwell on the difficulties because on the whole, most things are positive. But I think I think these are issues which we're which we can't completely ignore. I mean, that's my view. Um, I don't know. Join the join the
other views? Yeah, I'll, I'll just so, uh, say a few. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I think, Stuart, the, the work-life balance is a big issue. People are working a lot harder. And that's not just an imaginary thing that people are saying because they're, you know, they want to tell their head of department how hard they're working. But I also have experienced um, and talking to colleagues, not only here, but in other universities, there are, there's a, quite a feeling of isolation and a, a lack of belonging. Now, you lose that total lack of belonging. Now, that obviously has implications as well for research activities, because you don't have that, you know, that kind of community to, to engage in. I mean, apart from the fact that a lot of people's research has completely stopped for the moment because they've had to put it on hold. Um, but I do think that's worthy of note, um, Stuart. I think also the whole, the, the, the red tape and the bureaucracy and, you know, the, the lack of really discussion and debate over how we as individuals think that we should do our classes. Uh, you know, like, so being told that you have to use a certain sort of technology where you can't see anybody in the room. And then I just said, well, after a week and a half, I'm not doing this anymore because it's not good for my mental health. I need to see people. So there's a lack of taking into account, Stuart, how we as individuals actually learn and 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 depart knowledge and all of that sort of stuff and i really think that has been completely lost it's like a one size fits all and you'll do with it or not um the other things uh i actually think there are some i was just thinking what are the what are the benefits i mean there's loads of there's loads of negatives in this article uh, and alan and Greg and um, Barbara have summarized the negatives. There's a huge number of things around stress, issues for students, issues for staff, et cetera. But I think actually there are some really good positives here that we should, and I'm trying my best to be positive. I think that going forward, we can, as you say, Greg, really think about how we want to deliver these courses. There probably are huge chunks of our courses that we can deliver using the videos that we've already prepared. So we bring the students in and have more of a blended learning approach where we give them maybe work in advance and we spend more time in doing that. Because I think that's always something that we're always rushed with. We don't have enough time. We're too busy imparting the, you know, the lecture to them. So I think that could be a brilliant um, a thing positive. Uh, I think another positive is, and it comes out in the article too, that some of the students actually like this approach. Now, if you can get them to engage with you and put their, your video, their videos on, which I do in all my classes, the students have to put their video on and they have to actually talk to me. They do a bit in the chat, but I get them to talk. You actually can have a really brilliant class. I mean, and actually in some ways, I think my classes, some of them, believe it or not, have been better. But now you, that depends on the numbers, because if you're over, say, about 40, then there's no point and, you know, you can't do it. Not with a class of 100, but if you have small groups, like, say, up to max of 40, I think there can be huge benefits, Stuart, uh, in terms. And students seem to like the flexibility. And I think they do. Another good thing that's coming out of this, Stuart, is the attendance. Like, I have about at least 90% attendance in all of my classes, I think maybe that's because there's less place to hide because I do make them put on the video. So, you know, it's not just a name on the screen where they log in and then they walk, you know, they go to their grannies or whatever for their breakfast. Um, so so I, I think those are those are the, the, the opportunities as well. Now, I, I don't know for talking to colleagues and I know in England and Scotland that you are doing some face to face in, in Ireland, uh, including Northern Ireland. Um, my understanding is that we've completely walked away from face to face. We don't have any. And that was good having that clear message at the start that for the semester, we are not having any face to face teaching unless you absolutely necessarily have to, and you have to make a case for that. So we're kind of doing things quite, I think slightly differently to the rest of the UK. I think that's right. But I think it was good to have that clear message because then at least everybody knew what they had to do and everybody planned accordingly. And lastly, I think Stuart, to reiterate, we do have a great opportunity here to really try to think about what sort of students do we want to turn out at the end of the, their period, you know, the end of the three years. If we want students who are going to challenge and stop things like 
Enron, et cetera, et cetera, and speak out, et cetera, then we need to make sure that we're, you know, um, guiding these people and how to do that sort of challenge. And I think that this has given us an opportunity potentially to do that. Sorry, I know I've said that a bit three times, but I do think, I don't, th I, what I, I wrote down here, please let's not just go back to what we did before. Yeah. Yeah, I, think I think that's really think, important. Let's not do it. I think that's a really important message that we need to get across because, I mean, I know it's I've, my staff get sick of me saying this, but I have a I have a, a book on my shelves over here somewhere, which is actually my wife's book when she did education research when I was an undergraduate. But the book is called What's the Point of Lectures? Um, and the conclusion is that the lecture is pretty much what, like what we do. Um, not really much at all and this is written in 1975 so a long time before we had the internet and all this all this information available which we could guide students to quite easily and cheaply um and i think it's one of the things we have to bear in mind i mean lectures do have their purpose the way of making students enthusiastic um trying to encourage them along with some silly stories perhaps and pointing out some of the more complicated bits and things like this but is a lecturer the most effective way to do this? I think many of us really know that that's probably not the case. Because um, if students aren't engaged, and if in lectures, increasingly students are not very, very engaged, they're playing with their phones or whatever, um, should, should we not be trying to do something else? I'm not saying that's universal, but I think there's an issue there. Somebody's put up some a question here, I think, which I was gonna, I was gonna address, and it's gone off the top of the screen now. Um, something about students being tech savvy, more tech savvy than us. I have to say one of the biggest issues that we're having, and it's not, it's not with any particular group, it's the case with first year undergraduates who are nearly all Scottish, um, a few English this year because of grade inflation perhaps, but, um, um, and also, um, also the vast number of international students from guess where on our postgraduate courses is that they're not really comfortable with the sorts of technology that we use. They are not comfortable, we use Moodle. They are not comfortable with its structured format, basically. Um, they don't know how to find stuff. They don't know how to, to, to use it very well. Mm. And they're certainly not comfortable with it. And actually, I think their, their degree of tech savviness is quite different to what we might think. Um, those of us of a much older generation which I'll include me in, um, you know, have learned through several stages and therefore probably reasonably aware of lots of different types of technology. But um, I think I think the technologies that we use are problematic because they are structured organisational things and we're more used to things where what's important is the first thing on their board. And mm -hmm. they're not necessarily that good at finding the stuff that's important that's not at the top of the list for example um but anyway i do think there's positives coming out of this and i think we should we should try and think about those as well um quite big time and um, some more questions coming up uh, Stuart, i'm not had a chance to look at that yeah I, I, do you know what i think i think we might do at this stage because we have just gone over uh over an hour there is the chat here we are going to keep this call open so anybody who is on here we can continue a, a, a discussion um, uh, and we were hoping there might be a bit of a, a, a social interaction a, a, as well. But I think I, I think at this stage, we'll, I'll, I'll draw the formal panel discussion to, to a close. And thank very much again, Greg, Joan and Linda for their, their time, for the consideration uh, that, they, uh, that they gave to the questions um, uh, and the effort in preparing for today. Also as well, just to, to finish up, I want to thank my, my colleagues on the uh, the BAFA exec as well for the organisation that's gone in uh, and putting today's uh, events together um, and in particular in the background uh, as well uh, Tracy Shark, right, uh, who's been a great support and doing great job work with us in terms of moving things on online um, I think myself and Tevin uh, would be absolutely lost actually with, without her particularly in relation to uh, Tracy's the person that goes out and finds out about what's the good technology and the bad technology 
to running events. Uh, and so she actually filters through all that stuff before coming back to us. So thank you very much, Tracy. I also wanted to thank Dave Yates as well for helping out in terms of organizing the awards part of it. Um, so that's it. Uh, that's it for the moment. If you do want to stay on the call uh, to have a chat uh, uh, with people, then it'll be uh, we're keeping this open for at least the next half hour. Uh, and thank everybody for attending earlier. Thank you for advising us. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you Stuart. You.